Madame va s'exprimer en anglais et ça va être traduit. J'invite j'invite la technique. C'est bon Donc j'invite Madame Wu à se mettre en place. Elle est spécialiste du programme UNESCO, donc elle va se mettre en place. Monsieur Marc... Marc William, gestionnaire de pratique de développement numérique à la Banque mondiale. Donc, c'est Marc Magné. Donc, nous allons laisser la parole à Madame Oui pour son intervention. Merci. Euh, vous préférez je debout euh, assis Euh, bonjour, euh, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, je suis très contente d'être ici. Je voudrais euh, commencer par euh, féliciter euh, le travail extraordinaire euh, par le euh, professeur Alain Kindou, comme il vient de présenter. Euh, C'est impressionnant. Euh, aussi, je vous euh, félicite toute l'équipe. Moi, je suis euh, très heureuse vraiment euh, de vous euh, rencontrer en personne. Euh, ces sujets, euh, intelligence artificielle, est très important parce que l'ère d'IA, laquelle nous avons euh, à voir maintenant, c'est plein, plein d'avantages et de défis. Euh, je vous remercie encore, professeur, de m'inviter pour présenter le travail de l'UNESCO dans le domaine de l'IA. Il a aussi partagé une um, um, publication euh, j'ai coécrit et j'ai aussi distribué les sommaires euh, sur ces euh, sujets sujet euh, sous le titre euh, Steering AI and Advanced ICTs for Knowledge Societies from the Rome Perspective. Donc, euh, si vous euh, permettez, je vais continuer mon présentation en anglais. Um, alors, what is the Rome? With this term, UNESCO delivers a very strong message that we stand for an internet, AI, and digital transformation that is based on human rights, based on openness that is accessible by all, and governed by the multi-stakeholder participation. So this is what we call Rome, R-O-A-M. <coughs> that is also the consensus reached by all UNESCO member states back in 2015. So the question is, how we translate these beautiful principles into practice? We have developed 300 indicators to support all the member states to conduct national assessment so as to support the policy improvement and reforms through an evidence-based approach. The, the assessment at the national level has been rolling out very well across the five continents. The pioneer in Africa is really the project led by Professor Kindu and the UNESCO chair in Bordeaux. You have, you have succeeded the assessment of Romex indicators in Benin, which is the first country completed in Africa. Now, as you can see, we are having five continents, more than 20 countries assessing these indicators. In Europe, I mean, in France, we have the Internet Society, a chapter in France is leading the assessment of Romex in France. I'm also very pleased to inform that uh, last week, uh, the assessment in Germany has been completed uh, with the results and recommendations being uh, reported and presented at the German uh, parliament. So you can see the, 
the universal relevance of Romex indicators to all countries, global north and the global south, and also the universal pertinence of Romex to apply to all the digital technologies, whether internet, AI, or uh, blockchain, the entire digital uh, landscape. And also, I look forward to working further with our UNESCO chair in Bordeaux to explore more our possibilities doing the genomic assessment in West Africa. A unique uh, normative value of the framework is it has been really adopted and reflected in a number of uh, standard setting initiatives related to the AI. Uh, the recent one, the ongoing process at UNESCO is about uh, developing the AI ethics recommendation to be uh, discussed, endorsed by the member states in the forthcoming general conference in November. In a draft, now we are under the drafting process. It, it, can you see the draft in the draft values and the principles in this uh, draft document? The Rome aspects are, are everywhere, are well flagged. You see the human rights, you see transparency, you see multi-stakeholder. If this draft recommendation for AI ethics to be endorsed by UNESCO in November, it will be the first global normative instrument of AI. So the biggest question of the AI time is, what does the AI mean for society, for humankind, for humanity, for our, for our future? Without it being the technological determinism, this publication aimed to use the Rome prism to attach the central role of human agency, humanistic values to the AI development. So it explores how we can ensure human rights are being respected by the AI to advance the rights rather than to undermine them. How we ensure the AI is being developed in an open and inclusive manner. And how should AI be governed to be shared, to be driven by the different actors altogether. And never forget the gender equality in the AI age. And never forget Africa which not be left behind in the AI development. To unpack uh, uh, a bit further uh, of this publication, in terms of the human rights, the online content moderation, the per personalization automated by AI algorithm are potentially impacting the fundamental rights of freedom of expression and also the right to access to information. The digital platforms are under pressure to tackle, remove the disinformation hate speech from the uh, cyberspace using the algorithm, which are also potentially impa impacting our right to free expression and access. And the massive collection of personal data in a very opaque way the mass surveillance and uh, facial recognition automated by AI are being widely deployed. What are their implications on privacy, on everybody's uh, uh, personal data protection? That's a big issue. And also, because the advertisement uh, has been shifted to the digital platform, which, which are using the AI to disseminate news content, uh, we are witnessing the public interest of journalism and the media are getting distinct. They are dying and struggling to survive this AI era. Human society, we are, we are risking losing such a public interest a verified information channel from our traditional media and the journalism. That's one of the major subjects UNESCO has been raising awareness and advocated in the in the recent uh, 30 years anniversary of uh, World Press Freedom Day celebration in Namibia. We should support the media, support the journalism in AI era. And uh, AI has a profound uh, impact on equality, on democracy, 
in the society. The openness remains a challenge. The black box of AI, it's, uh, it's, um, it's still there. We need more transparency. And the openly available data is lacking. And uh, the markets, the AI markets industry are being monopolized and dominated by a few actors and uh, countries. On top of the digital divide, we are witnessing the emergence of an AI divide at all levels in terms of access to data, access to knowledge, training, research, hardware uh, they needed to develop the AI, particularly in Africa, in many other developing countries, actually. Uh, to, substantiate, to, to substantiate what I said, we also present another UNESCO survey we conduct among 32 African countries to identify their top need for support on AI development. As you can see, they desperately need the support on protecting personal data and privacy. They need support on the digital innovation, on the startups, and also skills and education. If you look at the AI landscape, the gender equality, the gender-based uh, discrimination bias persists uh, at the level of uh, data set, uh, at the level of uh, algorithm, at a level of the results. And also, you can perceive such a male predominance in the AI technical community, engineers, experts. Deep fake videos are really undermining women's security and the women's journalists' work. So if you share UNESCO's vision of Rome, if you agree that we should apply such a humanistic value and a human rights-based approach to AI governance, if you also have interest to use the Romex indicators in your research in your country, I warmly welcome you to join the dynamic coalition of Internet Universality Rome and Romex framework. We already have the UNESCO chair automatically, I mean, it's a part of us, but individually, I mean, all the researchers, academia, I really encourage you to engage yourself to this endeavor to translate these principles to action through your quality evidence-based research. That's so much needed for AI governance, for digital governance. You could, just, you could just click the link and subscribe to our newsletter and join us. I also warmly welcome you to all our events. We collaborate with UNESCO chairs and other actors. We are advocating the project in many events, including the forthcoming EuroDIC, forthcoming IMCR conference, particularly with the academic community and also in the uh, Global Internet Governance Forum in December in, in Poland. Uh, all the resources are here. I will share um, my PPT with all of you. You can download uh, the book, everything. We are open access organization, everything from the website. So, yeah, I think I finished. It's, um, it's, uh, it's amazing, automatically finished. Thank you very much. Donc, je, vraiment, je vous, uh, finalement, je vous remercie encore pour uh, toute votre uh, attention et l'accueil uh, très chaleureux. Je suis vraiment uh, très contente et c'est avec grand intérêt et grand plaisir uh, je vais uh, écouter vos interventions et discuter avec vous uh, uh, pendant ce aujourd'hui et demain je serai là. Merci encore. Um, thank you so much, Madam Hu. I think that uh, was one of, um, it was a beautiful presentation. And on top of that, I think the way she really explained step by step the work that they have been doing, especially uh, congratulations on your publication, the Steering AI and Advanced ICTs for Knowledge Societies. Great job there, Madam Hu. And also there are, the way that you have talked about how we can also join in this journey and research, which I believe is an opportunity for all of us, whether as researchers or 
or whether we are uh, already practitioners to work, especially in the area of rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholder engagement. Well done. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you. All right. Okay, maybe we can give a warm hand, please. Well done, and I think uh, we can move on, and, and uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Mark Mangene of the um, Anthony Mangene Foundation, and uh, give him the floor, because we have really been uh, looking forward to your presentation as well. So thank you so much, kindly go ahead, and we can and tell us what you have to offer for us on this morning. Thank you so much. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Au préalable, pourrait-on passer de la première diapositive, s'il vous plaît Voilà, merci. Donc, au préalable, j'aimerais, au nom de Daniel, mon épouse, et de l'ensemble des membres de la Fondation Anthony Mangan, saluer euh, le président de l'université de bordeaux Montaigne qui était présent tout à l'heure, ainsi que l'ensemble des organisateurs de ce colloque, en la personne du professeur Alain Kiyindou, pour leur implication et engagement à permettre, malgré les circonstances très difficiles actuelles, de permettre cette manifestation dont le thème d'actualité montre combien il est indispensable de partager les idées et réfléchir en interdisciplinarité afin d'élargir les regards et les champs de conscience, et ceci pour amplifier la dimension du savoir agir. Je souhaiterais aussi saluer les représentants de l'UNESCO, dont les bases de sa mission, l'UNESCO, sont de sensibiliser l'intelligence humaine, de mobiliser les outils de partage de l'information et d'amplifier le dialogue des cultures pour resserrer les liens entre les peuples et construire la paix. J'aimerais enfin remercier l'ensemble des intervenants et membres de cet auditoire qui, par leur présence, montrent combien il est important de réfléchir ensemble sur l'essor de l'intelligence artificielle, son impact, ses implications et conséquences, ainsi que sur l'évolution de l'homme et de la société qui en résultera. Conjointement, partager les regards permet d'élargir la vision éthique sur ce sujet crucial, qu'est l'interrelation entre l'intelligence artificielle et l'innovation sociale. Et la Fondation, dont l'engagement est de sensibiliser aux grands défis éthiques et d'ouvrir les réponses, se retrouve dans ces questionnements. En effet, l'éthique est universelle et touche tous les continents, tous les pays et tous les domaines de notre société et de notre vie. L'éthique peut être appliquée partout, car si elle est réflexion, elle est aussi action. L'éthique, c'est se poser des questions sur le monde qui nous entoure et sur les autres en sachant projeter son regard avec bienveillance au-delà des apparences, animé d'un esprit critique et responsable pour résoudre les situations. Au préalable, voici quelques mots pour vous présenter la Fondation Anthony Minguenet. Ses lignes directrices, son sens et sa finalité et parler au nom d'un homme à l'origine de celle-ci qui s'interrogeait sur le devenir de notre humanité. La Fondation est jeune, créée en juillet 2015, sous l'égide de la Fondation de France, qui est un gage de transparence, elle est à vocation universelle, c'est-à-dire qu'elle n'est reliée à aucune dimension politique, religieuse ou philosophique. Depuis... La Fondation, soutenue par le Conseil régional de la Nouvelle-Aquitaine, a noué des partenariats avec de nombreuses structures, universités et grandes écoles en France et à l'international. Vous en voyez ici quelques exemples, ce n'est pas complet. Plusieurs prix, dans l'autre sens, il faudrait revenir. Plusieurs prix ont été créés à Sciences Po Paris, au Québec, avec l'ensemble des universités ainsi qu'Ottawa, par l'intermédiaire de la société québécoise de droit international, ainsi que des enseignements ayant l'éthique comme fil conducteur, particulièrement au sein des écoles d'ingénieurs. 
Certains, d'ailleurs, sont validants au niveau européen. Nous avons soutenu un remarquable colloque avec le réseau des cliniques juridiques francophones il y a deux ans au Togo. Si vous voulez plus de précisions pour gagner du temps, il est possible de consulter de la, le site de la Fondation, même s'il n'est pas tout à fait à jour en, en raison des circonstances actuelles. Alors, pourquoi cette fondation, dont le logo est un phénix, symbole de renaissance et des idées qui essaiment En premier lieu, afin de poursuivre les idées et les actions de notre fils Anthony Maguenet, qui s'interrogeait sur le devenir de notre humanité et pensait sincèrement que toute authentique bonne volonté peut améliorer le futur. Il aspirait à participer à l'élaboration d'un monde plus humain et solidaire dans lequel les valeurs éthiques et le mieux vivre prévalent sur les visions à court terme et les rentabilités immédiates. Anthony Maguenet est né le 17 août 1974 à Bordeaux. Ingénieur en informatique, expert en réseau et cybersécurité, il était le responsable de la sécurité technique de l'ensemble des systèmes d'information au sein de la direction générale du groupe Bouygues Construction. Son comportement ouvert sur le monde et la société sa conception managériale courageuse et avant-gardiste, son sens humain ainsi que sa compétence professionnelle étaient appréciés et reconnus de tous. Il est décédé brutalement à l'âge de 40 ans le 20 janvier 2015 d'une hémorragie cérébrale, seule et sans assistance. Bien avant les questionnements actuels, très à l'écoute des innovations et de leurs conséquences, il avait compris que le respect et la priorité donnée au sens humain sont indispensables à une qualité de vie, au bien-être au travail et surtout à la réussite de toute technique, action ou entreprise, et ceci quels qu'en soient les domaines. Ce qui demande de l'intelligence et de la bienveillance, mais aussi de la volonté, du courage et de la détermination pour savoir exprimer un engagement responsable. En second lieu, la Fondation a pour vocation d'encourager et de promouvoir les prises de conscience éthiques, responsables, prospectives, innovantes et créatrices qui soient garantes des valeurs humaines aussi bien individuelles que professionnelles et sociétales. Un de nos engagements au sein des cursus universitaires et des structures professionnelles est de sensibiliser chacun à oser de plus conjuguer ensemble les notions de compétence, de conscience et de cœur qui nous paraissent absolument indissociables pour construire l'unité et la plénitude d'un projet, d'une structure, d'une société et surtout d'un être humain. Chacun ainsi, en liberté de conscience, pourra promouvoir cette dynamique éthique dans les réflexions et les pratiques afin d'apporter, avec un regard innovant et responsable, une aide aux décisions qui soit toujours garante des valeurs humaines. Redonner du sens, resituer l'humain, concevoir une nouvelle éthique dans les relations à l'autre et à soi-même devient une nécessité pour préserver l'avenir. Car, notre, car pardon, notre monde change et la place de l'homme, bien sûr, avec lui. Alors, comment définir l'éthique et son universalité Bien que l'éthique puisse être plurielle dans ses déclinaisons, ça recommence. Merci. Je disais que, bien que l'éthique puisse être plurielle, il en existe un sens fondamental, résumé par la définition qu'en donne la Fondation Anthony Minguenet, et qui est la suivante. Orienté vers l'autre, L'éthique consiste en une prise de conscience essentielle, intégrant le sens et la finalité de l'humain pour s'orienter avec plus de compréhension, d'ouverture et de partage dans l'engagement responsable et dans l'action. En effet, et même si l'on peut en débattre, l'éthique n'est pas une pensée abstraite, mais une pratique qu'il faut vivre, sous-tendue par un état d'esprit. Elle ne prend sa réalité que dans et par l'action dans la dynamique d'une action qui se veut juste et éclairée et peut s'appliquer à toute discipline et particulièrement, dans notre cas présent, à l'intelligence artificielle. Ceci est avant tout une ouverture anticipative de la notion de ce qui est juste ou non juste et prolonge la perception de ce qui est licite 
parcelle absolument essentielle de ce qui est ou sera légitime. Elle structure de ce fait une nouvelle relation à l'autre, au sein de laquelle les notions de dignité, de justice et d'équité, et bien sûr, nous l'avons dit, de bienveillance, au sein de laquelle donc, ces notions sont indissociables. Par cette ouverture de la conscience de soi vers une prise de conscience de l'autre, par la perception des lignes de force quant à l'évolution des concepts et des techniques, leurs conséquences et leur application pratique, technique, juridique et humaine, et enfin par la projection des espaces de liberté et de responsabilité qui en résultent, et ceci en réciprocité, elle devient motrice de l'évolutivité de la société. Elle permet ainsi, avec l'éclairage d'un esprit critique, d'acquérir l'art du jugement et de la décision et donc de l'action. Elle devient ainsi vectrice et même créatrice de sens et par ce fait acquiert sa dimension universelle au sein de tous les secteurs de la société. À la croisée des chemins d'une société et d'une humanité, humanité pardon, en potentielle mutation, force est de constater que l'on assiste à un renouveau de la réflexion éthique pour nombre de nos concitoyens, et qu'elle devient aussi un des fils conducteurs incontournables touchant tous les domaines. L'apport de l'intelligence artificielle, qui mobilise des connaissances multidisciplinaires, est à l'origine d'une nouvelle révolution industrielle et économique, qu'on appelle la quatrième, dont la dimension bénéfique est indéniable, et ceci dans tous les secteurs de la société. La santé, la recherche, justice, éducation, transmission des savoirs, transport, agriculture, finances, nouveaux emplois, la liste est ouverte. Elle est source d'immenses progrès dans une conception concrète et sécuritaire du bien-vivre, ainsi que d'une intégration collaborative positive au sein des nouvelles expressions de l'innovation sociale. Cependant, son essor fulgurant Associé à l'émergence de nouvelles applications de pointe, robotique, biotechnologie, voire aspiration au transhumanisme, ainsi que son emprise de plus en plus omniprésente dans nos domaines de vie, interpelle et amène à de nouvelles incertitudes. Au-delà d'une libération des contraintes qu'apporte l'intelligence artificielle, nous devenons conscients de la fragilité de nos systèmes, de nos dépendances, voire de nos aliénations potentielles. Ne risque-t-on pas d'assister à un glissement vers un enfermement progressif, non plus algorithmique, mais cognitif, lié à la force de l'utilisation et la perte de vigilance qui en résulte De nombreuses interrogations, parfois excessives, mais reflées aussi des difficultés à résoudre, se font jour. Stockage, véracité, utilisation des big data fiabilité des décisions algorithmiques et risque des décisions prédictives, capture des données personnelles, profilage et surveillance de masse, altération des libertés fondamentales, sans parler de l'électronisme et d'un futur potentiel chômage technique. Une autre interrogation, source d'inquiétude, apparaît aussi celle de l'autonomie future des intelligences artificielles auto-apprenantes, surtout à l'aube des extraordinaires potentialités de l'informatique quantique. Pourront-ils générer en propre la notion de concept et surtout celle de conscience, voire de supraconscience Pourra-t-elle acquérir une intelligence intuitive et émotionnelle à l'image de celle de l'homme. Entre artificiel et naturel, sommes-nous à l'aube de la révolution des intelligences Laquelle sera prépondérante Ou bien seront-elles complémentaires et œuvreront-elles en synergie L'intelligence artificielle restera-t-elle un outil au service de l'homme Qu'en sera-t-il de l'interface homme-machine et des futures interrelations homme-singularité À moins que se fasse jour une symbiose en l'homme augmenté. Cependant, la science comme la société avance aussi par la correction successive des excès ou insuffisances générés par les applications des techniques. Il n'est donc pas certain 
que l'impact de la puissance du numérique puisse à lui seul engendrer une mutation de la société et dont nous n'avons pas de certitude quant à sa place prépondérante dans les années à venir. Pardon. Mais il est possible de comprendre et d'extrapoler l'intelligence artificielle comme un enjeu global posé à notre société. Ces questionnements multiples traduisent bien l'évolution des consciences au sein d'une société et d'une humanité qui s'interroge en recherche d'elle-même, en probable mutation et en espérance du futur, particulièrement quant à la place de l'humain et le sens du progrès. Est-il possible de préserver le sens humain par la conception d'un numérique responsable Et je vais oser dire le développement d'une cybersécurité éthique permettant une chose essentielle, qui est la garantie humaine. Cette nouvelle numérique du numérique, intégrant dès le début une, autre, une éthique des données, une éthique de la réalisation des algorithmes et une éthique des pratiques qui en résultent. Cette conception de l'intelligence artificielle et d'une éthique by design est indispensable aussi à la préservation de quatre principes. La bienveillance, l'autonomie, la justice et la non-malfaisance, afin de limiter les risques de non-conformité et de dérive et permettre la réalité de l'innovation sociale. Dans les grands défis sociétaux, nous sommes tous acteurs et bâtisseurs, à la condition que soit exprimé, osons le dire, et ceci sans aucun dogmatisme, osons le dire, une exigence éthique qui est aussi l'expression d'un libre choix, celui d'une authentique responsabilité, non plus rétrospective et réparatrice, mais qui devient anticipative et préventive, prospective et donc protectrice. Mon propos est de mettre en valeur ce qui constitue le socle et la légitimité d'une culture de l'éthique et de l'intégrité, à savoir que le respect de la dignité humaine en toutes circonstances devienne un principe fondamental, inviolable et inaliénable. En tant que citoyens, il nous est impossible de nous dissocier des transformations du monde contemporain et leurs enjeux nous appartiennent à tous. Nous avons à faire acte de prévention en définissant les choix à venir et en ouvrant les réponses. Que voulons-nous Hommes libres, programmés, augmentés, asservis ou remplacés. C'est possible en devenir eux-mêmes créateurs de nos futurs statuts, réalités et définitions de l'homme. Où se situe la frontière Cette frontière souvent virtuelle entre savoir-faire et bien-faire, entre légitime et justifiable. Nous voyageons en ce moment vers des terres inconnues, et dans ce monde de demain à découvrir, ce possible cyberespace d'interdépendance où nous vivrons en interconnectivité, peut-il y avoir un humanisme numérique et une cyberéthique Les réponses à ces questionnements sont ouvertes et restent évolutives. Elles nous obligent aussi à élargir la réflexion ainsi que les chaînes de décision pour pénétrer dans cette nouvelle dimension possible du garant de la garantie du futur que l'on pourrait nommer le numérique éthique et responsable. C'est par cette dynamique, nous semble-t-il, que se construit le futur de notre humanité. Vaste programme, pourrait-on dire, bien sûr, mais il ne s'agit plus d'une utopie, mais d'un défi incontournable pour le monde de demain, voire d'une opération survie quant à la pérennité de notre humanité. Alors, intelligence artificielle, Innovations sociales et éthiques réunies peuvent-elles devenir aussi le fil conducteur d'un nouveau contrat de confiance pour exprimer l'art d'être humain et citoyen d'une humanité en devenir Que l'on pourrait formuler aussi par cette simple phrase d'Anthony Maguenet L'humanité est une aventure solidaire et responsable qui passe par l'autre. Au nom de tous les membres de la Fondation, je vous remercie pour votre attention. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. I believe that uh, you are doing a great job. Thank you, thank you. That was a great presentation. You have highlighted the importance, of course, of AI and social innovation, and that by itself is already um, a sign of the great work that you are committed to, not only uh, as a person, as a human being, but also as part of the greater community that we are in today. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker who is not here in person, but is going to be speaking online. So I hope that he is already connected. Is he already connected? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mark Williams, who is the manager of uh, the practice manager digital development at the World Bank. And uh, kindly take the floor and go ahead, please, Mr. Mark Williams. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and important conference. Um, my name is, as the Chair mentioned, my name is Mark Williams. I lead the uh, research and policy division of the World Bank that focuses on digital development. And we, across the World Bank, we've been doing quite extensive research into artificial intelligence and how it can be implemented in development developing countries and what the effects of artificial intelligence are likely to be from both an economic and a social perspective. So I'm going to just share a few slides on research, summarizing research around the economic impacts of artificial intelligence, and then talk a little bit about potential policy implications for developing countries, particularly in, in um, Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my screen, let me check and uh, you can all see it. In the chair, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So, first of all, artificial intelligence. Um, what's going to be the effect of artificial intelligence on economies globally as well as in developed countries? Well, the first thing to appreciate is that artificial intelligence can be thought of as a general purpose technology. It's a technology which is a very wide um, use in effect. It can be adapted and used in all sorts of different ways and therefore creates a, a platform technology um, which affects the whole of uh, manufacturing, economic activity and social activity. And, and as a general purpose technology, we expect it to disrupt broad areas of economies in both high-income countries and, and developing countries. But having said that, the evidence on, on this is still quite limited. Artificial intelligence is still at an early day, stage of rollout. And certainly in developing countries, particularly in Africa, it's, it's had quite limited uptake um, to date. But we can think of the effect of artificial intelligence in three different ways. We can think of its effect on the labor markets, we can think of its effect on firms, and we can think of its effect on trade. And in all these areas, um, AI is going to have both economic and social implications. First of all, let's just think a little bit more about what AI is doing in the economy. Well, we can think of it as having three different significant effects. The first is the productivity effect. The second is a distributional effect. And then the third one, uh, I would call other externalities, other non-economic or effects that are not directly economic. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those three. First one is around productivity. So AI is a technology which um, augments the factors of production. So when AI is introduced into existing capital, um, it improves the productivity of that capital. And similarly, when it's linked with um, labor, it improves the productivity of that labor. And it has a effect of both raising the output of those factors of production, but also creates new opportunities for innovation, new products, new services, and extending of existing products into new areas. So those are the very general productivity effects that, that AI is expected to have. Now on the distribution side, we think about what the effects of AI are going to be on the individuals. We think about labor, which is currently doing jobs which can be replaced by AI technologies. Those tasks and those jobs 
um, eventually will get replaced by AI, not everywhere, but in many cases they will. Um, but for, for jobs which are not replaceable by AI, AI, it has the potential to raise the productivity of those jobs, so actually increase demand for, for those types of the type of employment. At the firm level, we're expecting AI to um, enhance productivity of firms uh, and also generate a huge amount of value. But the question would be from a social uh, and economic policy point of view is how is that value distributed? Is it, is, is it true that the originators of AI, which would be mainly in the US, Europe, and, and in China, which can control the patent side, would they retain much of the value, or would that value be distributed uh, more broadly around developing countries? And then finally, what's going to be the pattern of effect of AI on countries? How is it going to change country competitiveness? How is it going to change the terms of trade between developing and, and paying countries? And what are the implications of that at the macro level? And then our final category of effect is around what we call other externalities. So issues around privacy, um, ethics, and decision making, policy decision making, which has already been mentioned so far. Um, I'm sure we'll be explored in a lot more detail in the rest of the colloquy. So the effects on the workers, um, we've seen, we can think of AI as an extension of an existing effect, which is the effect of automation and technology, which of course has been um, underway for, for many decades. And what we see is that even in rich countries, AI, well, first of all, automation and robots have been um, replacing jobs at a rapid rate. And AI is an extension of that, and it's gonna have a similar effect, but in new areas of the labor market. And what are those areas in the labor market? AI, as opposed to robots, are, um, is going to affect, well, it's most likely to affect better paid, better educated workers particularly those in the service industry, who are, which up to now, were not, they were not undertaking the kind of tasks, so they were not the threats of being replacement by automation. But AI is, is, is um, uh, capable of replicating many of those tasks and therefore replacing those jobs. So AI is having a display, job displacement effect, and it's also having this product, productivity effect. And it's the balance between these two which determines the aggregate effect, economic effect of AI, but also the distributional effect of it. We think about business models behind AI technology. First of all, the originators of the, of the technology are really heavily concentrated in, um, in North America, as I mentioned, Europe and, and China. And, and if, so the, the, uh, the control over the, the underlying technology, the, um, the licensing of that sits with, with, in those regions. But if we think about the value chain, the AI value chain as a whole, that's at the top, at the most upstream point, actually, is with multiple different stages in the, in the value chain that converts underlying AI um, intellectual property into products which are sold to, to customers or are used in, in government. And it's a pattern of business models, developments in each of those value chains, which each of those stages of the value chain, which will determine where the value is retained. Um, uh, as AI develops and propagates through the, through the, um, around the world. Uh, this is still a very open question. The history of related areas of business like digital platforms is one of extreme concentration and where value has been um, retained in, in the originating countries, in this case again the US and, and China. So this is something that we policymakers and researchers we need to be very conscious of uh, when we think about the potential future distribution effects of AI. And then we, we think about what AI is going to happen, what, what the effect of AI is going to be at the aggregate level, particularly through the um, considerations of, of trade. What we see is AI is substituting, um, we've already seen automation substituting for labor in, in many manufacturing processes. And AI is extending this process and it's also extending it within the manufacturing industry but also into the service industry. So that's having two effects. Um, one is it, 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 it changes the balance between developments of practices of production between labor and capital. So countries which have built a business from a trade export industry based around labor at cost arbitrage, where they've been able to use um, cheap labor in their country to, to export to, to um, high countries. Um, as AI further replaces those, those tasks and currently undertaken by workers, 
the rationale for outsourcing uh, or um, offshoring production becomes less, and it makes these companies, organizations in the destination countries are more likely to reshore. The second thing is that AI is spreading into new areas of the economy. So I mentioned before the service sector. So many developing countries have built um, industries around uh, call centers and business processes, <laughs> offshoring. And most of those tasks, and that was again a labor cost arbitrage, most of those tasks are doable by AI. So that has the potential to hit those segments of the economy in those developing countries very significantly. So what do we think, given the lack of evidence, what are our expectations about the impact of AI in developing countries? Well, we can think about this in the short run, medium term, and in the long run. In the short run, we think the effect is going to be relatively limited because rates of AI adoption are relatively low, and we haven't seen um, much impact on the technology market as yet. And it takes time for these technologies to speak through into those other macro effects. In the medium term, we would expect to see significant disruptions in the labor markets in some countries. And in the long run, essentially AI is cutting off traditional routes to development, uh, economic development for developing countries. So for example, moving from agriculture through to manufacturing through to services. The manufacturing stage of that process may be more difficult for many countries and could lead to premature deindustrialization. So if we think about the policy implications of this for Africa, well, the biggest challenge for Africa in this context is going to be the rapid growth, sustained growth in the working age population that's expected in Africa. And that working age population is going to need jobs. Uh, now, AI is potentially uh, replacing many of those jobs that would have otherwise been, um, could have otherwise absorbed the surplus labor. So this is going to be a big challenge for Africa going forward. Um, and another consideration, which is the, the education and skill level of the workforce within Africa. Um, one of the features of, of AI as a you know, extension of technology more generally is you're seeing a bifurcation of the, of the demand for jobs. You're seeing demand for low-skilled jobs, and you're seeing demand for high-skilled jobs. And it's a middle level of skills which is being replaced by technology, and AI will continue that process. So the result for, for um, developing countries, particularly in Africa, is that it has significant implications for demand for and the need for education and skills within the workforce, something which is um, uh, which takes a long time to develop. And then the second implication is going to be infrastructure. Um, AI, of course, is, is dependent on digital infrastructure, uh, both the capacity of it and the, and the coverage of it and the usage of it. So again, regions which have got um, limited broadband interest and cloud and data digital infrastructure are going to be at a disadvantage um, uh, when it comes to the adoption of AI. But there are some positive uh, reasons for optimism as well. Um, if we look at uh, historical other general purpose technologies, for example, electricity, what we saw is that there were countries which originated the, the technology in the first place, in the case of electricity and um, Europe and, and the US, the same could be, could be said of the telephone. But they spread, the technology spread extremely quickly. And if you look historically back at those general purpose technologies, actually the users benefited more in the aggregate than the originators. So AI is becoming what we would call productized. So from original um, patents and original tech underlying technology being turned into products, and those products are being sold mid, mid supply chain products, and those products are being sold and put into developing countries, and there you see rapid take up in certain segments of the economy in certain countries. The cloud business model, which of course is, is becoming very important, gives access to storage and processing capacity even outside countries um, where we outside the countries where the where the user is. And that's creating lots of opportunities. And so what we're seeing is the growth of AI based companies within Africa. And they, what they're doing is they're they are adapting underlying AI technology for, for local um, the local context. And so there are um, reasons to be optimistic about the way AI can be used and create jobs and wealth in developing countries. So what do the policymakers need to focus on? And this is a very broad, high-level um, view, but I would just say there are four areas where policymakers need to focus. First of all, is on infrastructure. If a country does not have sufficient digital infrastructure, it's going to be completely cut out of the AI value chain, both as a 
as a as an innovator but also as a, as a consumer and what will happen is the effects of ai will happen but they'll happen around that country uh, which won't be able to take any get any value out of it so that's the first point the second point is around skills technology innovation and ai particularly has significant implications for the skill requirements and this is expensive and it takes a long time to implement so policy makers this is becoming an increasing priority for policymakers if they're not to see severe impact on the labor markets over the decades to come. Legal and regulatory issues are key. Um, we've heard about these already, and I'm sure there'll be more discussion about it during this conference. The legal and regulatory issues in the way that AI is adopted um, and used, but also as a way that as a way of encouraging the AI adoption within um, organisations in in those countries. Um, is, it, is going to be an important driver of, of how AI, value generated by AI is distributed. And then finally, innovation, as I mentioned, there are lots of reasons to be optimistic about the way AI can feed into innovation and job and creation in developing countries. But that this is um, not going to in a vacuum, and policymakers need to support that innovation ecosystem if those countries are, are going to reap um, adequate benefits from technology. Thank you, Madam Chair. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mark Williams. Definitely, um, not only did you go into an explanation of how all these areas are working together, but you also hi highlighted the importance of infrastructure, skills, legal and regulatory, and innovation uh, very, very clearly and concisely. So thank you so much, Mr. Mark Williams, for your intervention. Um, we have come to the end of our session. Of course, we wish that we had more time in order to engage our panelists, but I believe they have already done a great job. And then again, we have the opportunity to engage them on a personal level during this conference. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, of course, to uh, my, my panelists. Thank you, Dr. Mark Mangene of the Anthony Mangene Foundation, merci beaucoup. And aussi, uh, aussi uh, Madame Hu Jiansong. Have I pronounced it the right way? Uh, perfect. <laughs> is a program specialist of UNESCO. Thank you so much. And online we had Mr. Mark Williams, the manager of practical development, um, digital development at the World Bank. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the panelists. And let us continue with the next session. Thank you and God bless.